Today we will begin Unit 1, the communication process. As we've discussed before, there are four units to the class and this is the first one. Have you ever considered why we communicate? There are many reasons that we communicate with those around us, so let's go over some of these reasons. For starters, we communicate to promote understanding. For example, Trey wanted the world to understand that he needed a girl. So he wrote a song about it to promote understanding of that particular idea that he had. When do you communicate to promote understanding? Another example of why we communicate is to make decisions. There are actually several careers that are focused on making decisions as part of their jobs on a day-to-day -day basis. Judge Judy, a popular TV personality, communicates with others daily to make decisions. Think about some of the decisions you've had to make and when do you have to communicate with others to make these decisions. Communicating to inform. We often communicate with others to give information. Oprah, when she had her own television show, she kept me. viewers He's informed of many him. different issues on the show, from the newest movies oh. coming out to new products to updates on what was going on with prior guests. There are many opportunities to be informed when viewing her show. Uh, her show was quite informational. When do you communicate to inform? We communicate to resolve conflicts or problems. In the movie Baby Boy, Jody had a number of problems he had to resolve by communicating with various people, including his girlfriend, mother, friends, etc. If you've ever seen this film, there were multiple situations that involved them discussing and working out issues to come to an agreement. There may have been times in your life where you had to communicate with someone to solve a problem. Can you think of a time when you did have to communicate with others to resolve a conflict? We communicate to meet social needs. Social interaction is a huge part of our day-to-day -day functioning. Uh, some socialization is more publicized, for example, with Kim Kardashian. We see her often uh, on the internet and on the news and on TV, and we see her social life. We see her on the social scene partying with her family and her friends. Although our social lives are not as publicized, can you think of a time when we have communicated to meet social needs? And when do you communicate to meet your social needs? We also communicate to persuade. Many of you may be familiar with the term persuade, so let's take a moment to think about what that term means. As you may already know, to persuade means to convince, to talk somebody into feeling or doing a certain thing. So an example we have of this is our politicians. For example, Obama persuaded millions to elect him to office in 2008 as the first African American president. Uh, to be a politician, you have to be extremely persuasive. and other. Occupations also require a bit of persuasion, such as anything having to do with marketing or sales. However, we persuade people on a daily basis. You may have persuaded your parents or friends to feel a certain way or to do something for you. Think about a time that you communicated to persuade. Okay, so now that we've went over the reasons that we communicate, let's break down the communication process. The communication process has several distinct yet interconnected strands. These strands also make up what will be our units for this semester. So the communication process is broken down into three different categories. 
interpersonal communication, group communication, and presentations. Now, what do these strands mean exactly? Interpersonal communication is person-to-person -person communication. So basically, this means you communicating with any other person, whether it be a friend, a classmate, a teacher, a co-worker, just one person communicating with another person. Group communication is communication within a group of three to seven people. You may experience group communication in a class when you're working in groups, if you're in any type of clubs or organizations, or even with communicating with your family. Your family may be made of three to seven people, and that's a group. And finally, presentations. Presentations um, are defined as a formal delivery of information to an audience. For example, if you're giving a speech or if you have, you're having to address a group of people at a meeting or even in church. I'll give you all a moment to write those items down. So let's go over the components of the communication process. The components of the communication process are basically what makes up communication. We have to have all of these factors present to actually be communicating effectively. The first component is the sender. The sender is the person with a message to communicate. For example, in this situation, who is sending a message? That's right, I am on this video that you're watching. The receiver. The receiver is the person who interprets the message. You would be the receivers in this scenario because you are interpreting the message that I am sending, which is information on the components of the communication process. Make sure you take good notes on the components because you will need these later on in the course. Okay, let's look at an example of sender and receiver. T.I. has an idea for a song that he wants to work on with Rihanna. So he tells her about it to get her opinion. Who would be the sender and who would be the receiver? The next components we'll discuss are encoding and decoding. Encoding is the process of putting the message into the form into which it is to be communicated. If you have a message in your head and you want to get it to a receiver, the only way they can know what message you've come up with is if you encode it into a form into which they can understand it. For example, you can write the message down and put it into the form of a letter. You can communicate it with your facial expressions or you can simply say it out loud. When the receiver gets the message and they attempt to interpret it, that is called decoding it. By decoding the message, that means they're either reading the message, they're listening to what you're saying and breaking down the words to make some sense of it, they're looking at your facial expressions and seeing what message you're sending by the look on your face. There's a number of ways you can decode messages as there is a number of ways you can encode a message. Let's look at an example of encoding and decoding. Jada needs to let Will know to pick up the kids from school. She can encode this message in a variety of ways. She could merely leave a note on the counter or she could call him up. She could send him an email. However, she decides to encode this message by texting it to him. So she types, please get kids from school today at 3. She has encoded this message into a form into which it can be communicated and he can interpret it. When Will receives the message, he proceeds to read it and decode the text to understand what she needs from him. By reading this text, she's, he is decoding the message to understand that he needs to pick up the kids from school today at 3.
message well of course with communication you have to have a message that is basically the the meat or the content of all communication uh, the message is the idea that the sender wants the receiver to understand it's a very simple concept however very important when we're discussing communication in the communication process so make sure you write this down Example of a message, Britney Spears writes a letter to her children from rehab telling them that she loves them. So, thinking about that with all of that information, what is the message? A. I'm in rehab. B. I'm bald. Or C. I love you both. The message is choice C. I love you both. Another component of the communication process is feedback. Feedback means the reaction of the receiver. So basically, however the receiver responds or replies to the message that they get from the sender, that would be called feedback. If you submit homework and I grade the homework and write a comment on it, my response to your original message to homework would be called feedback. In the prior example, Brittany's kids' response to their mother's letter would be their feedback. So if they write back, their feedback is basically their response because they're the receivers in that situation. Frame of reference. Attitude, past experience. Some people tend to get confused on the frame of reference, but it's quite simple. When you experience certain events, you normally regard an event like that in the future uh, in a certain way. You have a certain attitude towards that. For example, if you have a bad experience at a store, you may not want to go back to that store for fear that you will have another bad experience. Will has taken communication applications in the past and failed. Now that he's in the class again, he realizes from his past experience that he should complete all of his assignments. So your frame of reference guides you on how to handle situations in the future because you have something to go back on and look at. Does anybody have an example of a frame of reference they have towards a certain event in their lives or a certain experience at an establishment, a store? The next component, context. This refers to the physical, social, and emotional elements of communication. Context is very important to communication because it's really influential on in how we handle certain situations. Our physical context is basically our physical location, where we are. If you are in church, you communicate a lot differently than you would if you were in the library or at a party. Your social context refers to professional and social. If you are in a professional situation, maybe meeting with your doctor or your attorney or on a job, that would be very different than if you were communicating socially at a bridal shower or graduation party. Your emotional context is how the communicator is feeling. From experience, we all know that we communicate differently when we're sad than, we than what we do when we're happy or excited. So your physical, social, and emotional context really determines how we formulate the messages that we send. And I know this is a lot of information, so I'll give you a moment to jot all of this down. The next component of the communication process is interference. Interference is anything that gets in the way of communication. Um, 
the definition we will use here is anything external or internal that prevents communication. And of course, communication is the sending and receiving of messages. So the first type of interference, external, is from outside factors. If class is in progress and the office staff makes an unscheduled announcement, that is an external interference. You may also have noticed external interference if you're talking to someone and someone walks up and interrupts the conversation, or if you're outside having a conversation and someone comes by with a lawnmower, that loud noise would interrupt and interfere with the communication. Another type of interference that's harder to control is internal. This is from inside factors. For example, Lori's headache prevents her from really being able to focus on the lesson that Mr. Ritchie is presenting. So any type of internal factor that would prevent the sending and receiving of messages would be internal interference. I'm sure there have been many times that you've all experienced internal interference. If you have a stomach ache, or if you're just really tired, or if something is on your mind. You may have had an argument with your mom that morning and it's bothering you in first period. So you can't really focus on what your teacher is saying. Or if you're too distracted with an excited event coming up, that excitement may keep you from really being able to listen to your best friend talk about um, her problems with her boyfriend. Next, channels of communication. Channels of communication refer to the way the message is carried. The medium that carries the message is the channel of communication. And as we touched on before, when we discussed encoding and decoding, there are plenty of ways that you can send a message, whether it be letter, text, words, facial expressions, email. There's several ways that messages can be communicated. So it just varies. Um, greatly from person to person and situ situation to situation on what medium is used. However, knowing which channel to use in a communication setting is critical. If you don't use the right channel, you run the risk of sending the wrong message or sending it in an inappropriate manner, which can offend um, or not reach all the required receivers in time. For example, the different types of channels include face-to-face, -face, written, and electronic. If the school principal needs to get a message to all of the staff and students, he would not attempt to do that in a face-to-face -face manner. That would take entirely too long and it may be inconvenient. A better way to address the entire student body along with the staff, maybe electronic to get over the intercom and send one message to everyone at once. If teachers need to communicate a grade to a parent, instead of waiting for a face-to-face -face encounter, they may do better with sending a written progress report at home or even sending an email. However, if the message is something serious and something that you need to discuss in person, it may be better to have a face-to-face -face conversation. For example, if you're somewhere and you notice one of your best friend's family members being severely hurt, you may want to go and talk to them face-to-face. -face. That way, if they need support, you're there and in person and able to help them. And here's just the communication process model. You will all receive a copy of this. This is also available on the class website and the PowerPoint slides under class notes. And basically, it just puts together all of the components that we've discussed with the senders encoding a message and then sending it to the receivers. They then decode it. If they reply, that reply is their feedback. If the message is said out loud, um, words, verbal would be the channel, uh, although there are several different types of channels they can use. Any type of prevention of communication going on would be interference. Their attitude or past experience makes up the frame of reference. And then we always have to consider the physical, social, and emotional context because that will always influence whatever messages are sent. And again, you will receive a copy of that if you have not already.
Let's take a moment and pause the video so we can discuss the communication process scenario activity. Okay, moving on to characteristics of oral language. I know you've often heard um, that there's a certain way that you should conduct yourself in certain scenarios. And a lot of this has to do with oral language. One of the most common types of oral language that we use is informal. Informal language may include slang or colloquial words, which basically means that it's more conversational. You use informal language on a daily basis with your family and friends. It's really laid back and more likely to be something that you use in social settings. For example, we see um, Bernard and Chad using informal language and it's really casual. It's used with family and friends. Another characteristic of oral language is standard language, and this type of language is acceptable in most settings. This is what is socially acceptable and expected in public. Standard language should not only be used in professional situations, but also in everyday activities such as shopping in public. It's okay to use informal language around people that we know. Our family and friends don't expect us to speak in proper English all of the time. However, if we're out shopping and we're asking sales associates for help or we're on an interview or we're at the doctor's office, you should use standard language and use proper English because that's what we've been taught. Also, people judge you by the way that you speak and if you sound as if you don't know proper English, then you look really uneducated. You never want to give the wrong impression. So it's important to use standard language most of the time and just re reserve the informal language for when we're with our family or friends. So hopefully you all have this written down. And then finally, the third type of oral language you may not encounter as much because we're not in professions yet being high school students. However, it's called technical language. We also refer to this type of language as jargon. That's right, jargon, J-A-R-G-O-N. And you should be able to see that up on the video as well, the word in the definition. Jargon is language that's associated with a specific trade or profession. So if you've ever watched one of those medical shows and it sounds as if the doctors are speaking another language, it's because they're using jargon. Uh, you may ask why we're going over this, because none of us are doctors yet. But it's very important because there are also rules of etiquette that you must keep in mind when using jargon. For one, you should only use technical language when you're speaking to someone who can understand you. If your doctor came into the room to give you a breakdown of your condition, but only use medical terms, you would not understand what they were talking about. Other examples of languages that are specific to a specific trade or profession are police officers, military, football players. I'm sure that if you thought about it, you could come up with even more professions that use jargon. Okay, hearing versus listening. Have you ever been told, oh, I'm sure you heard me, but were you listening? I know I've told my children that more than once, so you've probably heard it before from a teacher or parent. What's the difference between hearing and listening? Let's go over some definitions so that we can be clear on the difference between the two. Hearing is pretty basic. It's the physical process of perceiving sound. By physical, we mean that if you have ears and you don't have some type of disability or handicap, you're not deaf, you should be able to hear someone. It's basically just being able to detect sound. The sound waves hit your ears and you are hearing. Listening is a little bit more involved and actually requires more than just ears. 
Listening is the physical and cognitive process of hearing something with thoughtful attention and consideration. So in addition to being able to detect sound because you aren't deaf, you're actually using your brain and thinking about the things that you are hearing. It doesn't mean that you understand. I've listened to things quite a bit. Sometimes I still don't understand it, but I'm trying to understand it. So that means that I'm listening and not just hearing. So it's important to realize that listening is not only a physical process involving your ears, but it's a cognitive process as well, and that involves your mind. If you take a moment to think, I'm sure there are times that you found yourself hearing but not listening. For example, when your parents are fussing or when you're in class and it's super boring or when we tend to doze off in church. Sometimes we are just hearing, but not necessarily listening. Although I know that that doesn't happen much. So everyone jot that definition down. The three types of listening we will discuss are critical, deliberative, and empathic. These types of lis listening are listed up here on your screen, so make sure you jot these down and we'll go over each in great detail. Critical, empathic, and deliberative. Critical listening, we listen critically pretty much every day of our lives. This means listening for information in order to make a decision or understand a situation. If you're in a restaurant and asking the waitress about the ingredients of a certain dish compared to another dish, or maybe in my case, how many calories one sandwich is compared to another sandwich, you have to listen to the information to decide what sandwich you want. If you are listening to someone to understand a concept, like how to solve algebraic equations, or how to know if a substance is an acid or a base, you listen to that information in order to understand. So we listen critically daily to make decisions or understand situations. When do you listen critically? Well, we have a scenario here. This may give you some details that will help you further understand. The promotions manager is explaining some new publicity ideas to Ludacris. Ludacris is listening critically to understand the information and decide if he wants to use the promotions ideas. So basically, Ludacris has to listen to all of the details about the publicity uh, package from the promotion manager. In order to understand that information, he has to make sure that he is really paying attention and evaluating the information to decide what's going to be the best decision for his company. The next type of listening is empathic listening. This is listening to show concern. Empathic listening is a good skill to have if you have any type of friends or family that may encounter some type of problem that they may come to you with and may look to you to listen empathically. I listen empathically when my children come home complaining about an argument with friends. I also listen empathically when my students are having a bad morning because they forgot all of their supplies at home and are losing points in their other classes. I also listen empathically if a friend just lost a parent or if another friend's dog got ran over that morning. You have to know when to listen empathically to show people that you care. Here's an example of someone listening empathically, Neo. Neo listens to his friend Chris Brown about legal problems. They're really good friends and this is a very serious matter so Neo listens to show Chris that he is concerned. Deliberative listening. Listening to detect a problem. Deliberative listening is maybe not as easy to understand as the first two, but if we take a moment to think about that word detect, we may be able to understand it more clearly. When you're listening to detect the problem, you're basically listening to information and trying to uncover if there's any additional information beyond what you're listening to. Uh, for instance, if, you, if your parent asks how your day went at school, 
they are deliberatively listening because if there's a way that they can determine that there was a problem in a class or maybe an encounter with uh, one of your friends or an issue with the teacher, they will be able to determine that by how you answer that question. A doctor listens to a patient's heartbeat deliberatively, checking for any potential problems. So with deliberative listening, I want you all to understand that there may not be an actual problem. However, you're listening to see if there is a problem. For example, with the doctor, the patient's heartbeat could be healthy and there could be no issues. However, they do listen deliberatively and closely and carefully because if there is a problem, it's important to detect it early so that they can do something about it. Okay, now that we've went over the type of listening, we are going to take a moment to go over a handout within our groups and see if we can apply these definitions to some actual situations. So let's pause while we go over the listening handout. Okay, let's discuss paralanguage. Paralanguage are the qualities of the voice. So we will go through these and give some examples. Okay, pitch. Pitch means sound. You have a high pitched voice. It usually sounds more of a shriek than a low pitched voice. And sometimes our pitch varies depending on what type of emotion we're experiencing. So it's just important that you get down that pitch is one of the qualities of the voice and that the definition is sound. You'll be tested on this information later. Tone. Tone is the mood reflected by the voice. And I know we have often heard from a parent or a teacher, don't use that tone of voice with me. Because it's not what you say, it's how you say it. So your tone of voice affects communication a great deal. Rate. Rate is the pace of words. How fast or slow we talk affects how we communicate and also how we're feeling or if we're excited or sad or happy can sometimes have an effect on the rate of our words. Uh, we tend to speed up when it's an emergency or urgent or when we're excited and then we tend to talk slower if we're maybe having a lazy day or just not feeling well or maybe even a little sad. So if you pay closer attention you'll notice how people's emotions affect their rate. Volume is just how loud or soft we speak. That's called the intensity of voice. And we all know that our volume varies not only with how we're feeling, but where we're at. We may speak louder at a football game because of external interference, but may speak softer in church or in a library or in a quiet store because of the environment. Then enunciation. Enunciation refers to pronunciation, which is how a word is said, the syllables in the word, and then articulation, which is speaking clearly and crisply so that we can understand every syllable and how those syllables make a word. Enunciation is extremely important. People often expect us to be able to enunciate correctly and clearly. That shows that one, we are familiar with the English language, two, that we are educated and know how to speak properly. So I'll give you a second to get all of these written down and any examples that you may have, you should jot them down on the right side of your Cornell notes with the definitions. Nonverbal messages. Paralanguage is also included in nonverbal message because it's not the actual words, but it's how you say it. Nonverbal messages are not written or spoken. So this is not writing a letter or sending a text message. These are all of the other types of messages that we send. So take a moment and think about those and we'll discuss some of the types of nonverbal messages that you send, such as facial expressions, body language, posture, how close you may get to someone. Those are all ways of communicating nonverbally. Nonverbal messages reinforce which means agrees or supports verbal messages, but they can also contradict verbal messages, such as your tone of voice may sound totally opposite from the message you're sending. If someone comes in and they're obvious, it's obvious that they are 
slump slouching over they're walking slow they look very sad and then you say well how's it going today and their reply is oh everything is great but if their tone of voice does not agree with that then their nonverbal message is contradicting what they're actually saying we often pay more attention to verbal messages, well, nonverbal messages actually, because nonverbal messages are harder to control. Verbal messages, we can manipulate our words to say what we want to say, but our nonverbal messages paint a true picture of how we're really feeling. So, of course, nonverbal messages influences the way people interpret messages because of, we pay a lot more attention to nonverbal messages. So, you'll find that you may interpret a message completely different from what's being said, but because of the nonverbal messages that you interpret. You will get a copy of the personal space handout, but just to go over this, the intimate space is under 18 inches. It's a really close, confidential um, space between people that are very close. Um, I want you to write out intimate space and then leave some room under that and write out personal space, which is 18 inches to 4 feet. Um, that's comfortable conversations among friends and colleagues. So you may be at lunch or at a shower or a party and people are within personal space sitting next to each other or even sitting next to someone at a football game or pep rally and you're in each other's personal space. And then social space is four feet to 12 feet and this is appropriate for most social and business exchanges uh, within reasonable situations such as this classroom, for example, you're all in each other's social space. Some of you are a little bit closer than others, so you may be in more personal space, but social space is usually what's appropriate. Um, you're not right on top of each other in intimate space, but you're close enough to carry a conversation and everyone be able to hear each other clearly. Public space is over 12 feet, and this is a situation where you barely acknowledge each, uh, each other. For example, if you run into each other in the grocery store or in a mall, you may see each other, but it's not close enough to really hold a conversation. So again, write out the types of space in the distance. And then I want you to put a few examples in your notes under each type of space, when you use that space, who you will allow in that type of space, and just an example of the space and how it applies to your everyday communication. And I'll give you a moment to do that. First of all, it's important to be well organized. If you are not organized, you run the risk of someone not being able to understand the message that you're sending. You also need to use precise and clear information. Uh, often when we're giving information to someone else, they have to differentiate what we mean and what type of communication preferences we have just in our way of speaking. So it helps if the information is clear so that's one less thing for the receiver to have to uh, decipher. Use appropriate language. Sometimes you may be speaking in certain situations um, where one style of language is more appropriate than another. For example, you wouldn't speak to your grandmother the way that you may talk to one of your homeboys. So it's important to use appropriate language when communicating. Speak clearly and concisely. Um, if you're not speaking clearly, it doesn't matter if the information is clear because they won't be able to understand the words that you're saying. So it's important to speak clearly. Finally, analyze your audience and receivers before preparing your message. Just like the example I just gave with your grandparents versus your friends, we have to make sure that our message is appropriately directed towards the audience that we're addressing. So you may be sending the same message, but if you're sending it to two very different types of people, then you may need to send it one way with a certain group and another way with another group. More of your responsibilities. Use effective nonverbal signals. Some of us tend to use our hands a lot when we speak, and sometimes that can get in the way. So we may want to pay close attention and limit that in certain situations so we don't confuse our receivers. 
we have to listen carefully. I've always heard you have uh, two ears and one mouth. So you have to listen more than you speak. And that's very important in communication. Communication isn't just about sending messages. You have to be able to receive them. Avoid overreacting. So this applies to all of you drama queens and drama kings out there who tend to overact, overreact at any given circumstance. You need to rein that in, stay calm, and make sure that you have an appropriate response so that you don't create a worse situation than what has to exist already. Then show concern about the message you are sending. No one will care about your message if it appears that you don't care. So make sure that if you're sending a message that you is exhibit the appropriate amount of concern. Provide appropriate feedback. It's important that when you're receiving a message that you give feedback so that they know that one, that you're listening. Two, maybe your feedback could have a influence on the discussion and three it shows that you care about the conversation and about the the sender that is speaking to you now that we've went over this entire unit i know it's a lot of information if you have any questions or comments feel free to share them now also if you need a review of unit one the communication process it can be found on the class website under the class notes tab you can download the powerpoint or save it to your computer feel free to email me if you have any concerns as well and i hope you took great notes because you will be tested over this thank you